In order to manage a platform shift, you need to be willing to redirect the whole company to this new future. You need to reallocate all your resources to the new way. And in the case of like a Microsoft, when they make that transition, they're reallocating billions of dollars of profit that's spinning off of the Windows business and the Office mm -hmm. business and the Teams business. That still takes incredible courage, right? To, to make that change in organizational skill to get people to see the new world. Well, Cladera's time to make that change was when it was seven years old. Yeah. It had $400 million of venture capital, uh, primary capital put into the company. It has still had a considerable burn rate. So it was a tougher moment in time to decide to redirect the company uh, to the new world. I still think, I still want to believe that it could have been done, yeah. but, but I can also say that when you have 400 million of VC money in, some of which has been in the company, you know, and in a bunch of employees and all kinds of, there's just a lot of stakeholders that, that there's a built-in inertia to stay the course. And um, that's really, really powerful. And you don't have a billion dollar profit machine yeah. to, to redirect to get to the new world. So um, I still think that like the meta lesson is you never know when you're gonna be called on to have a lot of courage, you know, to have to do something as, you know, and you look at like Airbnb, they had to make it for a pandemic. I, I, I still think like no excuses, like you need to find your courage in those moments to, to, to make the really, to make the scary move and, and redirect yourself to the new future. Welcome to Software Snack Bites. I'm your host, Shomit Ghosh of Bolt Start Ventures. And today we're excited to have Charles Zedluski on the pod. Charles was most recently COO at Temporal, previously was uh, GM of strategic businesses at Cloudera and global director of product at SAP. And in this episode, uh, as you can imagine, based on Charles's experience, we're gonna be covering uh, scaling product and operational excellence from the early days. And we're, we're very excited to dig in here. So welcome to the show, Charles. Thanks for having me. I, I want to start with uh, specifically, you know, your move from SAP to Cloudera, because I, I can't think of, you know, you had a, a good job, right? You're you're uh, you're sitting pretty at, at the big company, um, and you take the leap to join to a company that, you know, I, I think it started maybe at most two years before you joined, but still quite early. And so, just talk through, you know, how how did you decide to make this move, and what was it like during that transition? Yeah, it was easier for me than you might think. Um... I had started my career in software uh, in startups, um, not very good ones. Um, so uh, I um, I got into the software industry in '99. So I caught like the peak of the bubble was my very first software job, <laughs> and I had worked in um, two different startups. One one that I joined and the one that I started. So that was my first exposure to software, and I was as hooked on that as I was on technology. That after I kind of got introduced. I really enjoy the purity of I did work as much on problems that are like real world problems, market problems, as opposed to problems that are more to do with uh, how you navigate some big organization. There's a simplicity in that that I really liked. And the trouble was just that if you were working in software as I was in 2002, three, four, or what have you, there were startups, but it was a pretty bleak time. And there was a lot of consolidation. Uh, and there was this comment that some investor made to me once stuck that, you know, I probably put too much weight on. He said, uh, the one thing we know about you, if you've only worked in startups is that you're comfortable with chaos, but that's about all we know. Uh, and if we're hiring you to contribute to a startup, you ought to know something about how to scale it. So why don't you go look at someplace that's done that well, and that will probably help you. Um, so that was the advice I got. And uh, that was why I spent six years in this detour in large organizations, first at BEA Systems and then at SAP. And there's actually like a non, a pretty decent sized grade of truth in that advice. Um, I learned a lot at SAP and at BEA, and I carried a lot of those lessons with me um, to Cloudera and to Temporal. Um, but I knew that wasn't for long. 
And um, the thing that uh, made me think about getting back to startup land was as you kind of move up the ranks uh, in a large organization, the thing that I noticed was that every successive promotion that I got uh, was more and more a function of how well I knew how to navigate SAP <laughs> and less and less a function of could I build a great product or could I sell something or do something useful? And like, this is a scary skill set to develop, right? It basically means I'm going to be good at one and only one thing if I if I keep progressing here. So that's kind of what um, made me think about getting back to startup land. And then, uh, so that kind of put me in the right state of mind when uh, Jeff Hammerbacher reached out to me at Clutter. I'm going to ask this now, uh, but, but how do you fight that? Like, is there a way to fight that? Or when you're in a large company, is it just so institutionally ingrained by that point, just by the nature of the company having all these layers and stuff that at that point, like the only way to play the game is to play the game? I mean, there's a couple things I could say. You could you can moderate it. I don't think you can get rid of it completely. So you can moderate it by winding up in a large organization that's structured differently. So for example, Amazon, I think, is sort of pathologically afraid of this type of slowness. And so there's a bajillion general managers and a bajillion little mini kings of different things. And so you can have the sense of autonomy. It's not quite the same as really, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I'd say it's like like play, playing in markets. These big companies is sort of like playing poker with like pretend like play chips. Like you don't really learn poker with play chips. Like you have to unfortunately put real money down. Um, but it helps. Um, the the second thing I would say, which is something I did a lot at SCP, is yeah, you know, the saying is like you either build it or you sell it, and everything else in between is kind of noise. And so when you're in a young startup. Pretty much, there's like you can look at it as an efficiency ratio. What percent of the population is building and selling versus doing things other than building and selling? So, a young startup, that number is like 100% is building and selling. A large organization like SAP, 10%, maybe 15, <laughs> are building and selling. So, get to those places. And because uh, then at least you're developing, you're going to skip to see building and selling at a level of scale that you'd have to wait a very long time in your career to say otherwise. But the uh, the attraction, the, the majority of the jobs are not building and selling jobs in large companies. They are all that mess in between, the aligning of the building and selling people and so on. And those jobs have fancier titles and get promoted faster. So if you if you care about uh, sharpening your skills for, for startup land while you're in a big organization, get as close as you can to the 15, 20% of the employed population that actually does the building in the cell. Let's dive into the Cloudera journey a little bit. So, you know, you joined as SVP products. Uh, I think I've heard you say that there, there wasn't much product that was was kind of there at, at, at the time yet. And so, uh, so, I mean, how did you and the team decide what to start building? Like, w w were you talking to people? What were you doing? I mean, the, the basic story was the Cloudera was about 18 months old when I joined and um, it was venture back already. And so, um, it's not like they didn't know that they needed to have a software product. Like they, no one thought that they could build that Cloud Air could be built as a consulting and training company, which is largely what existed at the time. There have been two different attempts uh, to come up with a commercial product prior to my joining, and uh, for various reasons, neither one of them had worked out. That was actually lucky for me because I had a pliable audience. I had mm. kind of an engineering team that you know was ready to listen to someone about something uh, because they'd had two false starts and everyone just wanted something to work. Um, so that was sort of fortunate. And the first thing we could kind of anchor on was that the company was going to be a Hadoop company. That was why it was founded. All the founders had a connection to Hadoop of one way thing or another. That was a trend that people weren't seeing just yet. But if you were inside Cloudera, you could see that this was, this was what you wanted to be associated with. So the question was just how to get a product out of that. And um, the key issue was that um, we wanted our identity to be uh, a platform company. I think just the nature of the first 20 people that were hired, they were those kinds of engineers. Uh, the founders had that kind of mindset, but we had two problems. Um, the first problem was that the platform, Hadoop, was not something that the company had much control or influence over because it was a project that predated the founding of the company. And a second problem, which was the platform was very open, very open source. And so no one saw the point in paying for it. 
So these two things were essentially like the, the puzzles to solve. So we sort of said, all right, we've been advising companies in this, on this Hadoop and big data thing. We know we want to be a product company. We know our identity is something deeply connected to Hadoop and something kind of platformy, but we don't control Hadoop's roadmap and direction. And we it's open, so we can't really charge a fee for it. So what do we do? So essentially, we realized that we needed to recast um, uh, what our platform needed to look like, and we needed to rethink why a customer would pay us money. So the recasting of the platform was basically saying, okay, um, you know, essentially at the time, Cloudera had like a downloadable that was like a where the value add beyond what you could get from the Apache repo was install scripts, basically packaging scripts, um, and that wasn't enough. Uh, if you look, if I met a customer um, uh, and I said, "Hey, are you using Hadoop?" They're like, "Oh, we're poking around, we're trying it out, we downloaded it, we're great." Which one are you using? And every single time they would say, oh, the one, the Apache one. And I'm like, well, that's not good. They're supposed to use the Cloudera thing and no one was using the Cloudera thing. So we needed to add more value uh, to the open platform than packaging. It clearly wasn't enough. And we needed to do something where we wound up being able to shape the direction of the future platform. Or else, because if you can't do that, then you're not really a, a, a platform. Uh, and so what we did is we basically recast what the platform was. And instead of the platform being Hadoop, but installable, it became, we said, no, actually Hadoop is more like the kernel of a larger platform, the kernel of a larger operating system. And we've taken the trouble to integrate and assemble this all together like a single system, not unlike the way Red Hat assembles various components into a Linux distribution. So we said, really, our platform is a distribution, borrowing from, from the idea of Linux. And we've pre-integrated not just Apache Hadoop, but a dozen other related technologies. And this all feels like one coherent platform that you can consume. So that was one that we bet about half our engineering team on that. And, um, uh, and the beauty of that was now the future direction of that platform was entirely Cloudera's choice. We could add a thing, remove a thing, shape a thing. All of a sudden, we were in control of our roadmap, whereas before we were not, and we were delivering a lot more value to the open source users than we were previously. So it was kind of a win-win. Um, and then the second um, big change was saying, okay, well, how do we make money doing this? Because we said we can't make anything we do there closed because the origin of Hadoop is open. We have to build on that identity. Um, it's central to why it's succeeding too. So it, the things Cloudera had built in the past were more like platform features. And so inevitably those wound up in open source. And so everything Cloudera was building, there was already a free equivalent. And so they, were, they weren't they were sort of successfully staying in front of the steamroller that was this open source community. They said, look, we need to do something where we reason like user in, not platform out. And we will find a different set of problems if we do that. Uh, and and, and th those will get rolled over by this open source steamroller. So we sort of said, well, okay, what users are hanging around this platform? And there was like developers uh, of a kind, they are like the engineers. There was um, uh, operators, some had it missed or this thing. Uh, and then there were uh, analysts and data scientists, like people, mostly data scientists, there were a lot of analysts back then. So we said, all right, which of these users can we reason in from and like come up with some value add and we arrived at operators as the one that we wanted to serve. And, and essentially, this was uh, for two big reasons. Um, the, the first is that uh, we, th we felt like by process elimination, analysts were too removed from the platform. So there was not enough interrelationship between what the platform was doing and whatever we built for analysts. So we thought we wouldn't be as successful at that. We also didn't think we had the skills for it. Um, at the time, this has changed. But at the time, we said, well, people don't make money building developer tools. Uh, that's not really uh, conventionalism now, but at the time that in 2010, uh, that was a reasonable thing to say. Um, and the other, so by default operator, and then the other thing, the nice thing about this is that the people that tend to have the budget for operating things tend to also the budget for support contracts on platforms. Mm. And so uh, it naturally dovetailed. So we bet the, and, and we thought, you know what? We could see unique operator challenges that you couldn't solve with just Puppet and 
uh, New Relic and you know off the shelf operator technology. Cloudera was the first commercially uh, successful distributed system, and we figured there'd be something about this distributed nature that would create new ops challenges, and we get really good at solving those. And so we would do something special and different than whatever it was. So given that distribution uh, that, that you were selling, right, that, that packaging that you were selling, I'm assuming that the support and, and still the services angle was, a, was still a decent component to what it was, right? Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So, so we deliberately bundled all of that together as one decision for the customer. And that was a very uh, explicit choice. Um, essentially, uh, what we found was when you first met a customer, uh, what they valued foremost was support because they're new to this platform. It's scary and different. They're going to bet something on it. So the insurance policy of having someone to call if something goes wrong, especially in year one, that dominates the attention of the customer. That's the bulk of the value that they're perceiving. And the ops stuff we did, they don't know why that's valuable. They've never had to operate this thing before. So their sense of like kind of appreciation for what we'd built was very low. Conversely, if you let time pass and you get to year two or year three, they value support some, but less, right? Because it's like having you know fire insurance in your house and knowing your neighborhood see a fire in five years. You're like, I don't know how much I value this insurance, right? But now they've lived with the platform and now the functionality of the operator tools uh, was, was you appreciated that much more. So I'd always say they kind of, they came for the support and they stayed for the functionality. And so uh, having that all in one subscription was, the, was central to how we were able to succeed. Yeah, I uh, I think that adage has has been remixed now multiple times, especially even in the age of AI. But uh, I, do do you remember how you closed the earliest customers? And it, did they all come from that consulting base originally, and then saying, okay, hey, now we're delivering this distribution to you, or was it different? So essentially, uh, at you know one point, Clutter was purely consulting, and then at some point, we said. If you're going to get our advice, it's only going to be if mm -hmm. it's on our distribution because we know what version and what patch level and all this other stuff that we can kind of control. So we kind of want to do from that. And then, well, I mean, the two big shifts was getting everyone to believe that the distribution was a more valuable artifact than just packaging up the dupe. And then the other one was saying, oh yeah, like we're going to give you support. You're going to have this distribution that stays behind with you. And you're going to get this, this other functionality that lets you run it in production. You're going to have all this extra uh, extra production capabilities that you wouldn't have had previously. That was sort of the entree uh, uh, that we had for, for the early customers. And we sort of relaunched the platform um, and then proceeded to evangelize it to any of the customers that we were doing consulting with at the time, which was you know, half a dozen. This isn't like a lot. Um, but one of them in particular, um, uh, I guess I could, it's a long time now, I could say is eBay. Uh, you know, They were already using, uh, starting to use the technology in a big way. And they uh, bit big on, um, uh, on this new platform vision. And they made a very sizable order uh, and that basically was what convinced the company that this was the path, mm -hmm. right? So we sort of made a bet. We allocated our re team. We said this is the way it was going to work out. But it sure helped that nine months later, you got a seven-figure order from one of your five consulting customers. Uh, that that kind of locked the whole company into this direction and, and, and committed us for the foreseeable future. That's a pretty nice first customer to have, especially given the slope of the adoption curve that happened uh, yeah. <laughs> thereafter in their product too. And after that, it felt like Clutter was just born under a lucky star. Like there was a two-year period where everything we wanted to have hit just hit. Well, so uh, I, I want to talk about that. And in the context of, of you becoming uh, a GM, right? Because you, you moved from SVP product to, to now... GM of, of strategic businesses and and that sort of aspect uh, and and so I guess like wh what was that change about like what did that feel like especially in the context of this massive scaling journey from you know zero to 
800 million. Yeah. And, and Cloudera was pretty scaled up by the time I was a GM. So Cloudera was already maybe uh, six, seven, eight hundred employees uh, at the time. Okay. And uh, at that point, you know, I, I was solo, you know, practitioner when I joined Cloudera. By the time I added this GM thing, I, no, I was pretty sizable product team. Um, but what happened was just that Cloudera had uh, um, grown into all these other markets. And uh, the way the, the rules of those markets worked was different than the core market. So the core market would be what people would think of as like a data lake business today. Mm -hmm. And that was more than half the revenue of the company. But we had um, the beginnings of machine learning and AI business. Uh, we had done a, a small acquisition that that was the the basis for that. We had a um, burgeoning uh, data warehouse business. There was uh, some sizable investments we made in SQL engines to make that possible. And uh, we knew that we needed to be in the platform as a service business. And so in each one of these, there was something about that, the, not just the product was different, but that the form factor was different and the user was different and the go-to-market was different. And that's what kind of necessitated us adding this other piece to the organization. The biggest difference for me, honestly, was the nature of who I was managing because the way I was as a leader, because as a leading product, um, it was, I think one of the main jobs was to just be a really effective uh, cult leader. You know, how do you get everyone to believe in a, in a certain future direction? And whether that's the engineers in the company or the customers or the analysts or the sellers, there's there, you, you know, if you can do a good job of that kind of mass hypnosis, you're that's it goes a long way to being successful in that capacity as a product leader. And that was also for now a market that was established and understood. And it's more like how do we win the next chapter in the story? Um, if you look at these um, strategic businesses, first of all, they each have their own GM that uh, worked for me, and two of them were former founder CEOs, uh, and the other one was an experienced executive. And so um, they didn't need a cult leader. And what they really needed was more me to use. Now I was the one that got good at navigating inside, you know, some large organization, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I needed to. Uh, bequeath that, basically like give them that ability without them getting mired down with it and give them the freedom as entrepreneurs to make uh, to become successful in markets that were new again, right? Like for the machine learning and AI market was fairly nascent. The past market was fairly nascent. And so you're back to like climbing and experimenting now. And, uh, uh, and but you've got these really clever entrepreneurial GMs that are doing that. So th those are some of a lot of people say when they say they have GM experience, they call it owning the PL. Yeah. Do you? I mean, do you really think that you didn't own the PL on the products as as a as a product leader? Like, I kind of feel yeah. like you did too, right? Like, yeah. You... I I think that sort of stuff is overstated. I I think you know, there's only one CEO of a company that they own the PL. <laughs> I I think the, it's understandable why people say that because it's important for their careers. But I think the mindset is honestly that's the that, that same statement I think is a little bit the, the the drawback of the GM model, which is anyone who's really fixated on owning their P and L means they're not they're fixated perhaps more on that than they are on the aggregate success of the company. I think yeah, sorry, I, I I think that's I think that's a bit overdone. Okay, yeah, that that makes sense. Um, what about what happened? Like you talked about all these areas that Cloudera was already going into was a first mover into stuff like that, right? Yeah. And then, of course, we 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 we've seen the story now. I mean, Cloudera is still still a, a very large business, but certainly there have been you know some some other companies that have come in and yeah. and captured uh, a, a large part of the current share. And so, I guess, would you attribute that to was Cloudera missing a technological shift, or was there some sort of innovator's dilemma or, or issues? So I think you you characterized it accurately. I think look, Cloudera was. By many standards of success, uh, five billion dollar exit, all, all the venture investors made money. A lot of careers got made, um, and an industry got changed. So uh, that's all great. But I think Cloudera didn't realize its full potential. Um, you know, I it didn't become 
uh, one of those companies that endures and stays relevant for 20, 30 years, which is a very verified error, but I think was absolutely something that Clyde Error could have um, could have had. The proximate cause was pretty straightforward. By, by 2016, 17, 18, uh, the trend to public cloud was really starting to build steam and AWS uh, specifically. So if you were going to grow quickly, uh, you really needed to be able to grow in the public cloud as much as in the data center. Um, when Cloudera started to grow in the public cloud, um, it turned out that the public cloud, Amazon at the, at the time, but really the other ones wound up working in fairly similar ways. Um, it basically uh, took a lot of Cloudera's key advantages and turned them into disadvantages. Mm. And that was a real bummer. So um, three examples. Um, firstly, uh, in the public cloud in AWS, if you're going to put data somewhere, um, Amazon did their pricing in a way where it's very hard. You don't really want to use their disks. You want to use their object store. So they've made it so that you you re- all roads lead to the object store. Uh, by the way, not because it's cheaper, but because that's a strategic choice they made. Oh. So when all roads lead to the object store, what that meant for Cloudera was the storage that Cloudera was built on, the HDFS, went away. That was a huge advantage for Cloudera because all the other workloads you ran in Cloudera were highly optimized for HDFS. Now, at best, they're a level playing field with S3. In reality, Amazon was already more optimized for S3 than we were. So one of my things is like, try to not build a platform in somebody else's platform. <laughs> right. That's a tough way to go. So um, we lost the gravity of HDFS. We lost the performance optimizations that we had as we were kind of forced economically to work on the object stores. That was, that was advantage number one that turned into disadvantage. Second one was Cloudera in the data center was built on physical clusters. And therefore, you had multiple applications that you would run in the same cluster. And that made Cloudera Manager, the management framework we built, which had by that point gotten very sophisticated, very valuable. In the cloud, the compute model is ephemeral, it's very easy. So clusters are disposable. Mm -hmm. So you don't really need as much of a fancy operational uh, suite for a disposable thing as you do for a precious long run. So a lot of the uh, advantage of Cloudera Manager turned into a disadvantage. It was a drain on our resources to kind of keep keep making Cloudera Manager better. And then the third thing was that the go-to-market that you model, that AWS had in the public cloud, was night and day different than the go-to-market model that Cloudera had. And so trying to stay compatible with Amazon and sell alongside them uh, was, was super challenging because Cloudera was... Clutter's go to market was predicated on a totally different uh, business model. So, in all these ways, advantages turn into disadvantages. Um, now, I don't want to like excuse that away and say that that kind of explains the entirety of why uh, Clutter didn't realize its full potential because we saw this coming, right? It's not like you know, there's a lot of smart people at Clutter in like 2015, 2024. You know, we 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 could see that this was going to be a thing. And, and I think there's other companies that have successfully navigated platform shifts, like you know Microsoft, right. if you look at how they've uh, made the transition of the cloud. Uh, the thing is, though, uh, in order to manage a platform shift, you need to be willing to redirect the whole company mm-hmm. to this new future. You need to reallocate all your resources to the new way. And in the case of like a Microsoft, when they make that transition, they're reallocating billions of dollars of profit that's spinning off of the Windows business and the Office mm-hmm. business and the Teams business. That still takes incredible courage, right, to, to make that change and organizational skill to get people to see the new world. Well, Cladera's time to make that change was when it was seven years old. Yeah. It had $400 million of venture capital, uh, primary capital put into the company. It has still had a considerable burn rate. So uh, it was a tougher moment in time to decide to redirect the company uh, to the new world. I still think, I still want to believe that it could have been done, yeah. but but I can also say that when you have 400 million of VC money in, some of which has been in the company, you know, 
and in a bunch of employees and all kinds of, there's just a lot of stakeholders that, that there's a built-in inertia to stay the course. And um, that's really, really powerful. And you don't have a billion dollar profit machine yeah. to, to redirect to get to the new world. So um, I still think that like the meta lesson is um, you never know when you're going to be called on to have a lot of courage, you know, to have to do something as, you know, and you look at like Airbnb there, they had to make it through a pandemic. Mm-hmm. I, I, I still think like no excuses, like you need to find your courage in those moments to, to, to make the really, to make the scary move and, and redirect yourself to the new future. Yeah. I, I think it's like you said, it's just so challenging. Like you're already making revenue. You want to go public. You want to like, there's all these like components to it. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's almost, it's still not easy, but like you're, you're already on the journey of stacking quarters, right? right? And to now be like, hey, instead of stacking quarters, you're, you're going to reallocate, go after you're gonna this. You're going to blow thing. that whole thing up and you're going to reset the revenue and the relationship. Yeah. It's like, imagine if like Sneak came to you tomorrow and was like, hey, we're going to push out the IPO for two years uh, because there's this whole new trend thing. We've got to like, it's got to be a reset. The business model's going to change. We're going to redo the leadership team. We're going to redo the product. You know, maybe may, you, know, you guys have all. If you said sign us up, you know, you've been in there, you've been involved the longest. You know, you tell me how excited you. <laughs> it would it would take a lot of uh, a lot of discussion and thinking for sure. But um, but I, I want to move into uh, uh, some of the, the the COO role that that you had. And so um, so I guess that starts off with with temporal. Maybe describe what they what they do. But but also even before you do that, what was the context behind you uh, making the move over from Cloudera to temporal? The context is actually fun. So the short story is um, I got asked to consider uh, getting involved with Temporal by um, the earliest investors at Amplify Partners. And I did a bit of reading on the documentation of the product and I was sort of immediately sold. And that's unusual for me. I'm pretty analytical. Um but the thing was, I sort of had this cheat, which was at Cloudera, whenever we thought, you know, we were like, oh, this great trajectory up, and we're like, where would we go if we needed to do the next big thing? Uh, like, what would be the next growth traje- vector for, for the company? Um, we sort of said, well, probably be something transactional. Like, that would be, if we really wanted to be the next Oracle, that would be the thing to get into. And so I read a lot about where transactional platforms were um, headed, and I was sort of unconvinced. I, I sort of saw a little bit about like what um, why Cloudera was able to sort of crack the code on on analytical platforms, which had hadn't really been disrupted in twenty years. And so I thought I knew a little bit about kind of what it took to unlock something uh, tricky, and I wasn't convinced by you know like the distributed databases and a lot of the other things I was seeing. And then I would just read the docs for Temporal and I was like, that's the ticket. And the thing about it was Temporal doesn't really, uh, is not really a database company by any normal standard. But one way of looking at what Temporal is, is it's basically reimagining how, the, what a transaction used to do, it's basically reimagining it. And uh, in a way that makes sense for the way applications are built today. So to, to, to be specific, what Temporal is, is a platform that, that reimagines how you write and run software. And essentially, any feature that you uh, build while using Temporal as a platform, that software, that code you wrote became fault tolerant and durable without you having to think about it explicitly. And it turns out that if you make software fault tolerant and durable, you, you've essentially solved for all of these things that are otherwise really tricky to solve for in engineering. So you basically make the software rock solid reliable, like the failure rate drops by more than 10x. And you greatly simplify uh, the software engineering. So feature velocity goes up by two to three x because all the nature of how you handle failure and being distributed and being correct all got outsourced to this abstraction. So basically incorporate this platform into your software engineering cut your failure rate by 10x, uh, increase your feature velocity by 2 to 3x. That's ultimately what the pitch is. But what it looked like at the time was, oh, I can sort of underwrite any function a developer writes with this sort of transactional state management. 
And in the process, it's going to unlock, it's going to basically make all kinds of developments. So that's kind of the, the, the rough idea. That's the best way to explain durable execution that I've heard yet. So th thank you for that. Hey, thank you for using the phrase. That was uh, like developing the category was part of building Temporal. Yeah, but um, that's where you, you, you joined SEO. So you've done SVP, you've done GM, now you do COO. What's different about you know, that is anything different? Is it all the same? Like, no, 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 a lot's different. So, so the main thing for me was I felt like the, the thing I could take with me from Cloudera was watching this distributed systems company evolve and open an open source business. But, but the thing was for me too was at Cloudera, um, over the years, I watched, I was part of the leadership team this whole while over, over nine years. And over nine years, I watched that leadership team get reconstructed four different. So by the time I left Cloudera, I was working for the third CEO. Uh, I was working alongside the fourth uh, head of engineering, the uh, third CMO, the you know the third CFO, and or second CFO, and so on. So I kind of always used to joke I was going for the double wraparound, where I kind of worked with like two of everybody. Um, but I felt like I had taken away a lot of lessons about company construction and culture and teams and business models. And, you know, like I said, there's these proximate causes of why Cloudera ran into trouble, but there was lots of other sort of debt that we had built up over the years um, that it, it, in a lot of it, I used to say, it's like the things I was, when Cloudera was a thousand employees, there was things I was really proud of and there's things I was a bit embarrassed by, but both cases I could trace a really high fraction of it decisions we made when we were 50 or 100 employees. And, and I was like, okay, well, that's kind of a point of view that not many people get to have. And I think Temporal's got this really special potential. How can I apply that point of view? And that's essentially why I wound up performing this role as COO, where I built out all of the business aspects of the company. Um, in practice, what it means is, you know, when you're the product leader, it's a lot of strategy, a lot of design thinking, and a lot of trying to think where the world's going to head, but some management and leadership. Um, but, you know, Ben Horowitz has this great um, uh, old blog post about like, there's one he has on being a good product manager, and he has another one on being a manager of product managers. And one of the things he says is when you're kind of a product leader, yeah, you need to be a good manager, you need to uh, be a good leader, you need to be a good coach, but mostly you need to be right. Like you're placing bets to the company's future. And if they're wrong, there's very difficult to come back from that. Uh, so there's an enormous premium of being right as the product leader. I think as COO, that's less true. I think there's a much bigger element of it that's management and leadership and a much smaller fraction of it that's strategy and design thinking. And it's still helpful to be right, but it's not quite as important to uh, to be right all the time. Uh, and sometimes letting other people on the team be a little bit wrong uh, is okay. And and so I think that's kind of the operative difference. And, and that also, like time allocation is totally different. I spent, um, COO is so much a recruiting job. Mm -hmm. You know, 35% of my hours of somebody who's recruiting. Wow. Because I mean, the company went from, you know, it was about 30 some odd people when I joined and the next, you know, by the time we're at 150, the you know more than half of the incremental hires were were in my area. So there's a lot, a lot of recruiting. Um, so yeah, those are a few differences. That's very interesting. I I, I want to ask you when you when you join Temporal, right? Uh, huh? And you have this you have this title. What? How do you figure out what to do? <laughs> like your first day, you know, is, yeah. is it just like? I mean, I'm sure you do the cut in product. You would go do the customer listening tour, right? And you'd be like, okay, what, what's happening, stuff like that. And I'm sure you did that here too. But like, how do you figure out what to do? I mean, again, I think COOs come from different backgrounds, right? And people come from the sales track, the marketing track, or in my case, the product track. But you know, part of my mentality is that I think um, when startups are young, the product defines the rest of the company. And then when companies are mature, the company defines the next product. And so I very much thought, how could I use my product mindset to think about what it is the company needed? Um, and so in the case of Temporal, I 
it was just listening. Yeah, yes, it was listening to where I talked to all the existing. There was seven design partner customers, but there's users in the open source community. That was probably the more um, insightful uh, conversations. But there were a bunch of conclusions that you draw about things like, okay, what's the value this technology is delivering? To what set of users? Uh, with what skills and aptitudes? How do they perceive this value? What are the necessary conditions so that they actually realize the value after the fact? Um, how are they, you know, all of that is basically gives you the trail of breadcrumbs that tell you like where to, um, where to spend your time and energy or where to allocate the company's resources. So in the case of temporal, um, you know, kind of early clues, let's see, what are clue clearly was that really difficult, um, difficult thing to describe, like the core technology, you're basically selling an abstraction that no one's seen before. And so everything about the positioning and the storytelling uh, and, the, and the framing and getting that right, we, I knew that was going to be really, 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 really tricky and much trickier than Clon Era. Um, the, that was a bad news story. Um, a good news story was um, that once people adopted Temporal, convincing them that they might want to adopt the paid product was very straightforward. So there was a very clean connection between the open source adoption uh, and someone who was eventually a prospect for being a paying customer, which meant you could pour all of your energy to the open source community. Like you didn't need to worry that that was wasted time and energy because essentially you knew that sooner or later, they were going to see the value in the paid product. Maybe it took them a month, maybe it took them two years, but it, none of that energy was going to spill out onto the floor, which would have happened at Cloudera, actually. There was actually only a loose connection at Cloudera between the open source adoption and who eventually became Cloudera's paying customers. So um, that, that was kind of a second key uh, difference. And then the third one was realizing, oh, because Temporal... Temporal can be done, used very incrementally. Like you can implement a single service or function and uh, underpin it with durable execution. That's not at all true for analytics. Mm. In analytics, the value in analytics is in combining information. So um, there's always there's very limited standalone value in a single data set or a single user. You kind of immediately have to get a, put a bunch of stuff in the pot till it gets interesting. So for Temporal, that wasn't the case. You could get success in a much narrower scope. And that meant a much smaller number of humans needed to agree to adopt it in the first place. So that's that's essentially where some what some of the clues were. So for Temporal it was um, get the storytelling right on and, and figure out how to explain this abstraction, which eventually turned into what we call durable execution. The second big one was um, figure out how to pour as much of your life energy into growing this open source community, because if that works, the rest is probably going to work out okay. Um, and build a business model predicated on lots of small incremental success, which is why uh, Temporal ultimately uh, became built as a consumption business, whereas Cloudera was a subscription business. I want to double click on the positioning aspect. We There's a lot of technical founders that listen to this uh, podcast. And I think a lot of them go through this thing where, and I think especially when they're early, right? It's like, okay, we're going to describe what the product does. And you need to do that, right? You need to say, hey, here's what the product does. That's the that's what people will you go to the open source or close or whatever. Like they, they need to know what it does. However, at some point, right, you need to now be able to have um, a CEO of a company who's maybe not technical or something, understand still what your product does and be able to say, hey, this is something we should bring in. So you need to articulate that value. And I guess for those technical founders who are trying to close their first sales, they're trying to you know hire people, they're trying to you know continue to push forward the product, right? And then you're saying, hey, just trust us. If you work on this positioning thing, like it could unlock markets in a big way, right? Like how do you? I mean, how do you get people to figure that out? I think I can give you a lot of good first principles arguments for why you care. Um, my practical experience is that those only work to a limited degree. And the risk is like, ultimately, once they see it work and they see some momentum from the success of good positioning, then everybody's very convinced. The trouble is there's a decent amount of lag 
from when you have to establish the position until when everyone else realizes it's true. And so the question is, how long will people keep the faith uh, while they're waiting for it to work? So at an intellectual level, what I could say is the reason why you care about positioning is because forget even about CEOs. Like if you have a tool that only a practitioner uses, well, positioning is kind of good even there. But what I would say is that uh, it's rare that just one person in a business decides to adopt a technology. It's typically more than one person. Temporal was simpler than Cloudera. There are fewer people involved in the decision than Cloudera did, but there were still at least two. So essentially like one engineering team needs to decide. And so they don't all have the same motivations. And positioning in part is the way where is a basis upon which they are talking to each other and building consensus amongst one another about why they should adopt in the first place, right? Because that one person says, well, I just like it because I don't know that async thing is easier, right? And that's as much as they know how to say. But if they can go to their colleague that's got more of an architectural mindset and they're thinking more like, well, why does this, I'm glad it makes your job easier, but why does it belong in our stack? You also wanted us to use Erlang. That was a crazy idea, you know? So why are, why are we going to take your advice now? But if the other person could say, well, it belongs in our stack because essentially applications are becoming distributed and there's this kind of change in architectures. And have you noticed these other things going on? So I look at a lot of it as like good positioning is actually arming your champions to make the argument for you in the co- amongst the cadre of people that are ultimately going to decide to adopt you. Look, most founders want to be famous, right? They want their, their technology to be famous foremost. So the, the trouble is then say, well, prove that this is what's happening. And what you're really trying to do is get them to imagine a conversation that they're not actually privy to. Mm. But you know what you hope for, and you know, it, it, in both cases at Cladera and at um, uh, Tiforo, it took about a year. So you need people to keep the faith for at least a year. And then you know, in the case of Cladera, uh, the big gift for Cladera was. Um, we said, oh yeah, it's going to be this distribution and that's going to be the new platform and everyone's going to believe this and got up on stage at the new world and kind of said this and, you know, some tepid applause. Um, the biggest gift in the case of Cloudera for making that positioning real was that IBM and MapArt copied it. Uh-huh. And then like, like for like, and uh, that wound up forming up everybody else's opinions pretty quickly. And uh, that, and you know, that really good deal, that one customer, that kind of that made everybody keep the faith. Um, in the case of Temporal, um, we introduced durable execution as a position uh, nine months after I joined. So it took that long to be confident that this was the right way to frame what it was we were doing. And we introduced that at the first ever developer conference. Uh, again, tepid applause. But a year later, the number of independent tech- people who came to the conference or technology companies that were already referencing it, invoking it, and uh, riffing on it was easy for everybody to see. And then, like reinvesting in that, you know, keep keeping the faith after that's a lot easier. When, when you're just, when you're coming up with that 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 phrasing, right? Like that durable execution phrasing. Like, yeah. I mean, you you said like you got the you know you get the tepid applause, right? Like, do you go and test it with open source users? Do you go and test it with design? Like, we did all. We did. You know, we, I mean, you can you can look at. 30 drafts and not just this phrase durable execution, but essentially what you're doing is, and again, in this case, it's a new category, right? What you're doing is you're basically saying, I'm going to make up a new club that everybody's going to want to be in someday. And so the club needs to have a reason for existing. It needs to have membership rules. Uh, you know, it needs to have a secret password, you know, <laughs> like a secret handshake. Like there's all this stuff that goes into the club. The name of the club's part of it too. Like if it doesn't have a you know good name, then the club's not going to get any many followers. But that's essentially what you're doing. And so what we had to do at Tech World is say like, how do we circumscribe what it is that we are? How do we distill the essence of the point of this thing? How do we locate it in the arc of history of technology so that it makes sense why this club needs to exist today and didn't need to exist five years ago? Uh, and what's the basis for being in the club? And so there's very, very specific uh, points for all of that. And then and it's like, okay, great. That's the architecture of club. Now, how do we turn that into a very compact set of phrases that are very easy to uh, share and riff on and extend 
that connote the idea of the club. And so, yeah, we did a lot of iterating um, with it first internally, and then we tested it uh, before uh, before eventually making it the primary way we talk about ourselves. So those same founders will be listening to you speak and be like, ah, oh, Charles is awesome. You know, like, let's get him on the team, right? Like, when, how should they think about hiring a COO? Like, when, when is the right time? Is it, is it when you're going to, when you're going to scale, like it, does there have to be, can you clearly see the scale and be like, okay, now's the time to do it. Or, or what are the components? Yeah. I, I don't think it's a function of scale. Um, uh, I think, I think the, the motivation is everything to do with whether or not you should be deciding if you want to hire a COO and, uh, the, the motives are everything. And, um, if your motive as a founder, and let's, I think you and I both probably work with a lot of technical founders. If your motive as a founder is I'm doing this because I don't like any of the business aspects of running a company and I just don't want to think about it. That's probably a bad reason to do it. Um, and similarly, it's like, I don't know if I really want to like own the number of, you know, and own the expectation for growth. Um, and I can get this other person to do it. I think those are the, the, the not good reasons to do it. I think the reason why people contemplate having COOs is when they have a bunch of different parts of the business side of the company that are interrelated that they want someone to think about and manage holistically. Because one of the things I, I saw when I was at Cloudera, which was kind of an education for me at the time, was when you hire individual functional executives, uh, for the most part, not always, I'm not trying to like overgeneralize, but for the most part, you are hiring a playbook. They have built a, um, let's say it's a value cell, or let's say it's TLG demand gen, some such. Once you hire that playbook, if you need a different one, expecting that person to learn the new one, very low odds. Right. So you're going playbook shopping to a large extent when you hire functional executives. And I think the question you should be, someone should be asking, maybe it's the COO, maybe it's the CEO, maybe it's somebody else is, which playbooks do we want at this company? What's our situation? Uh, and if we take this playbook, well, what does that say about these other two playbooks we need? So if you build a solutions architecture team with a certain set of skills and a certain size and a certain profile and a certain leader, what does that say you're going to do when it comes to support and success? Um, it immediately implies there's more or less room for that other thing. And so that, in my view, that's the thinking and the work that you want a COO to do. And so wh why are you hiring that as a founder? Well, maybe some person has some expertise you don't have. You're like, I just want this knowledge in the company. Or maybe there's three other really critical things to the long-term success of the business. And your bandwidth as the founder is on that. And you just can't allocate enough to this other thing. Um, and I think that's the reason why you want to do it. And those moments happen uh, at different phases in the life of the company. So in my experience at Temporal, it was early in the life of the company. It was essentially, there was a tiny bit of revenue, but you could effectively think of it as pre-revenue. Uh, so very, very nascent. So it was the V1 assembly of all the playbooks. And in my view, that was great. You know, For me, it was a lot of fun. And I feel like hopefully, uh, so far so good, if you look at the growth trajectory of the company, that this, this is a... Uh, a system that seems to scale and fit match the situation in the company well. But I've seen people hire these roles at 5 million revenue, 15, 50, 80. I think a lot of times what happens as you're scaling is sometimes you have some combination of these different playbooks and you feel like you took a wrong turn somewhere. You don't like how the whole system is performing, but you can't quite isolate where. You know, or you've tried and you're you're kind of like, I don't know, it's just not working and 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 the way I know it needs to. Okay, it sounds like it's time for somebody that's gonna think about this holistically. So you see other people that come in as COO in very later, much later stages. Um uh and and I think uh but I think in all cases what you're looking for is someone who thinks about a bunch of different customer facing parts of the business in a holistic way and wants to think through how you're going to mesh together a bunch of, of, of really good functional leaders, but it really matters which ones and, and how they all team together. So on that leaders thing, the classic thing you always hear is, oh, I want to hire a player coach, right? Um, and and uh, 
I guess one, have you ever seen a true player coach work? Uh, and do you think that people need to decide, hey, no, you need to choose one or the other? At Cladera, we had almost no player coaches over the years. And in Tipporal, we used that construct extensively. And I would say with hindsight now, I would probably do a blend. Um, you know, what? I guess the way I think about a player coach is you're probably getting someone as a player coach who has a lot of potential, already is clearly strong as an IC, um, but could be a leader of some kind. And uh, you say, okay, you're going to be in this player coach mode. Um, and, and then, you know, perhaps it'll grow with the company versus you get a pure coach, you're hiring some leader from, from the outside. I think that going all leaders from the outside uh, is a mistake. And um, I uh, we did that a lot of that at Cladera. Uh, I was arguably probably the exception. I was probably the only player coach, essentially, you know, that started you know, Cladera. And um, I think that all leaders from the outside sort of tends to suck a bit of the soul out of the company because you just get a lot of people that are just well, I did this hot thing and now I'm doing that hot thing. Well, where's the lick breaths? And like you get all the, they're very savvy and they're very polished and they know a lot. So it's not, I'm not trying to diminish all of like the value of outside execs, but I've seen this repeatedly actually. When you're scaling, you bring in a small army of these all at the same time. And that getting them to all mesh together is much harder because they're all used to their way of doing things. And so there's just a, a, a lot more annealing to kind of get it all to, to, to bind together. And it's not guaranteed that you did better than the people that were already at the company. Because if you're scaling, it's because you're you're already got some degree of success. So what's wrong with the people that help get you some of that success? Um, in, in a lot of times, I think people over-index on uh, the outside exec because they get hypnotized by the polish um, that the inside people tend to have a lot less of. The person that joins you at 50 employees has a hell of a lot less polish than the exec that you meet that's going to join at 200 employees. And I think that people over overweight that. And Martin Casado had this tweet I really liked where he said, executive presence is not a thing. And I really, I really like that. Now, the counterpoint is, if you go heavily on player coaches and these kind of up and comers, the great part is you get people with a ton of drive, a lot of get up and go because they're probably more entrepreneurial. They're excited to prove themselves in this bigger role. And if they do and they succeed, they become sort of some of the entrepreneurial energy mm -hmm. in the company that you really want to have around when you're at 500 people. Because that's what you're desperate for at 500,000 people. You're not desperate for more execs or more employees. You're desperate for more people that think like early stage employees that have that startup verb, right? So if you can have a couple player coaches and grow with a company, you use like these energy crystals kind of parked throughout the company that like help kind of keep its entrepreneurial drive going. Um, I think you can overdo it though. And and uh, the, the overdoing I think comes because a player coach comes with an implied promise of coaching and mentoring, right? Like when you hire an exec, it's like, it's a tool for a job, right? No exec is hired uh, expecting that then they're going to show up in the CEO's going to coach them how to do their job. That is not, you know, that is not the social contract. But a player coach, you kind of are expected to invest and to help build build those people up. Um, and, and they're in it because they want to get to some bigger role. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so you need to only do it when you think you have the time to mentor and build somebody up. And then the second piece is, if they don't get that bigger role, if they wind up not being able to grow personally as fast as the company needs them to in order to kind of live in that that new bigger role, you're going to have a problem on your hands. They're going to be frustrated. They're going to be dejected. They're, they might you might have they might be at risk of churning. And this is one of your your better ICs. So um, those are the drawbacks. So I think you know if you have too many player coaches, the problem is you just don't have the bandwidth. Um, to to mentor them, and the odds are you many of them won't make it to permanent coach, and you'll wind up inadvertently training some of your better people. So, two final questions for you, and the first one is, and and this is actually going to be kind of weird almost to ask you because you've seen so much success uh, on on the scaling side, but what's the most common failure path 
that you see on that scaling journey? The the one that um, just stuck with me the the most was how much you get the success or failure on uh, on on the execs that you hire. Um, I think that that's the, the the pathology I see the most often, right? Which is company starts to do well. Oh, it hits some bumps in the road. We must have the wrong guys or gaps. Right. Yeah. They ran out of scale. Uh, we got the wrong one, but that's okay because this time we've got the right one, or we've got the one with more scale or what have you. And uh, this, you know, from a hundred employees to a thousand employees, I think that's the most common narrative you hear again and again is this thing. And people over explain the circumstances of the company this way. And um, that's a real, and that generates a lot of really expensive churn. Every time I have ever seen like mid flight, like, oh, we got the wrong so and so, and now we got the right so and so. The right so and so, half the team from the wrong so and so, they all churn out. Uh, and the new team shows up from them so called right so and so, who might not be the right so and so, and they all cycle in. So you think about, and you lose quarters of execution time. You lose tons of dilution because you had to hire the you know the old batch left for stock. The new batch needs more stock, um, and then two years later you're telling yourself the same story. So yeah, I think like the average tenure of a CMO right now is down to eighteen months. The average tenure of a CRO is somewhere around twenty four months. Uh, and and I just don't you know uh, uh, you know I always I always like the um, line from like John Travolta before he got the Pulp Fiction gig and he was kind of out of work and he said. You know, I was never that good, and I'm not this bad. Uh, and <laughs> that's a little bit how I, you know, I think that there's a lot of other uh, things that explain why a company is or is not scaling successfully. And companies should be inclined to search for those other explanations first before devolving to the default one, which is this person isn't working yet. Uh, the wrong guy or gal, and we're going to find the right guy or gal, and that's going to make all the difference. <laughs> that Travolta quote is great. Uh, I love that. Well. Uh, final thing I want to I want to end with you on is um, you've done the successful thing at, at you know the, the the large orgs like SAP where you have to learn that path and 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 how to manage that politically. You've done the zero to massive scale. You've done again going early. Uh, you know all these things have worked. What do you think your edge is that enables you to be able to evolve in these different scenarios? Yeah, it's funny. My edge is actually pretty small uh, when it comes down to it. I think um, what I settled in on is I really enjoy working on technologies that are some kind of platform or system. Part of that's just the kind of people it attracts. Um, I love being around people smarter than me, and platforms and systems tend to attract um, a really, really high caliber of technologists. So part of my edge is just enjoying working around people much smarter than me. And I like the sensation of being on the back foot and like just stumbling to figure out, like try to keep up. Um, I, I, I want to believe I can still grow as a middle-aged dude and people constantly making me feel dumb is a, is a great sensation. <laughs> but the other thing connected to it is, um, Platform businesses, there's a bunch of unique things about the way platform businesses work, uh, the way the markets work, the way the products work, the way the categories evolve. Uh, and there's a bunch of unique mechanics there. Um, and I've been lucky enough to, you know, between Cloudera, Temporal, BEA systems, get to see a, a, a couple of those stories evolve and a lot of twists and turns. And that's still not that common. There aren't that many folks that, that get to that have the had the luck to see that. Working with like really, really nerdy technologists on a platform business, there's a lot about the psychology of that and the kind of business building of that that I'd love to do. Well, uh, Charles, I want to say thank you so much for, for the time. And we, we ran a little bit over, so I appreciate you uh, uh, taking the time to share all of your advice. Um, you know, is there anything you would like to highlight for the audience? I'm hoping the answer is that you're going to be writing a lot more and sharing some of these insights. But, you know, what, whatever you'd like to say, uh, is there anything you'd like to highlight uh, for, for listeners? No, I think this. I really enjoyed the conversation. I'm really grateful for the for the opportunity to chat about this. I hope you can tell, like, I like talking shop. So, you know, for the audience, it's just, you know, 
hit me up on on Twitter or LinkedIn if, if you like talking about, about building these kinds of businesses. I, I, I love that as a call to action. And, and thanks again, Charles. Really appreciate it. Thank you.